Hi, my name is David Christopher and I'm the Senior Inbound Marketing Manager for Big Wing Interactive and I'm going to talk about the lessons in link building that our agency has learned from the last 10,000 hours, billable hours of content marketing that we've um, done for our clients. This is me and my career path through journalism uh, where I learn about content, audience development, where I learn about social media, um, through SEO um, and uh, link building. And the founding of um, an agency, Big Wing Interactive, with, with my boss, the director of Big Wing Interactive, um, and b the building of our content marketing product, which really sort of brings all of these different um, disciplines uh, and draws on all of them. We used to think that we were pretty good at link building. Uh, we had innovated what we called the gold standard of links. <clears throat> and this is pre-Penguin and pre-Panda updates. And uh, these links were varied anchor text in original pieces of content written by uh, English native English speakers uh, on websites that had um, an editorial policy with a human editor. And we thought that that would keep us pretty safe. Uh, but it turns out that you can still build article, what Google later came to classify as article directory links um, on those kind of websites with all of those, uh, meeting all of those checklist standards. And what we found was that um, Google penalized us about 10% of our clients um, and 10 out of those 11 clients we managed to rescue from the penalties um, and kept as clients. Uh, we rescued the 12th but lost as a client. Um, so we did the right thing. But what we found was that our link builders were very disheartened. Um, they knew that Google wanted to crush them, essentially, um, and that what they were doing bore little relationship to real marketing. <clears throat> so we decided to, we had to change fundamentally what we did. And the first change that we made was to our reporting. And this is the fundamental change that really changed everything else. Instead of reporting on the number of links that we had created, we started to report on the activities that we undertook. And this is uh, real data. <coughs> and it shows a blog post being created in an hour and a half. Um, the social media sharing of that blog post in uh, you know, a little over an hour on Facebook, Twitter, relevant Google Plus communities, Quora, and, 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 the, and a Reddit community. And then six months later, um, the owner of a website gave plus one to the Quora answer and this content marketer reached out to him and asked if they'd feature um, you know, that blog post on their website and they obliged and it, it generated a link. Now the interesting point here is that uh, in our old system we could never really have done that. With this kind of reporting um, we get the kind of flexibility where we can the content marketer themselves can decide what is most appropriate use of time for the client. But it also means complete accountability and transparency which is necessary if you're going to try and um, foster a relationship of trust and get the kind of communication that you need from a client in order to execute really um, some of the, the tactics that I'm going to talk about later. But that kind of transparency in our reporting meant that we had to also become much more orientated to the real marketing goals of our customers so that they would look at our reports and know that we understood them and know that we were working towards real marketing goals. So the first goal, the first question that we have all content marketers ask before they create any piece of content is, what is the goal of this content? And I like to think of this as a dartboard with conversions at the center. Conversions being somebody um, you know, picking up the phone or walking through the door. And then around that, permission assets. Um, these are assets um, where somebody has given you permission to speak to them in future or market to them in future. Things like email signups and Facebook follows. And then around the edge, qualified traffic, social engagement, and relevant links. And these things are relevant, qualified, and engaged to the measure at which um, the folks, the traffic that travels through them is able to convert or likely to convert. The more likely the traffic that you're driving is to convert, uh, the more value that you are giving as a content marketer. The second question of two is what is the promotion plan? So it's not enough to just create the content and then hit publish. Uh, we also need to think about how we're going to market it. Content plus marketing equals content marketing. 
And I like to, um, what you're seeing here is all of the different inbound marketing tactics, perhaps not an exhaustive list, but a very inclusive list of all the different things you might do in inbound marketing. And I like to group these into four disciplines, content, social, search, and outreach. Content is you know, the creation of blog posts or landing pages. Social is the growing and posting, uh, the posting to social networks and the growing of those social network audiences. Search is all the things we traditionally think of SEO, keyword research, link building, etc. And outreach is reaching people and trying to get them to share your content with their audiences predominantly. Now there's some question as to whether uh, content marketing is synonymous with inbound marketing, it's the same thing, or whether it's a subset. And this is my take on that. I think that a traditional journalist is uh, focus in the discipline of content. Uh, they hit publish and then they don't have to worry about the audience. That is assumed because you know, their, their outlet has an audience. A blogger might look more like this. Um, they're trying to generate their own audience often through social channels. Social media marketer, link builder, SEO, and traditional PR person. And a content marketer, I think, draws on the disciplines in this way. Content is, is at the center of what they do. They need to be able to create good content that will fly. But then they also need social media, outreach, and search to get an audience for that content. And the better they are at that, the more inbound marketing tactics that they know, and the deeper their knowledge in those tactics, the better able they will be to create an audience for the content that they're trying to market. And that's very different from the link building job uh, that we originally started with, which was much more of a sort of a hacker mentality, I suppose. And over the year, when we were transitioning from link building to content marketing, we did a gap analysis of the skills that were required for, for folks, and we over-communicated, if anything, um, the distance that they needed to travel. But what we found was that we needed to, of the nine link builders that we had, we needed to fire two of them. Two of them quit. One of them moved into SEO because it was a better fit for their skill set. And only two of them managed to successfully transition to content marketing. So these are very different jobs. And there's an essential spark that's required of a content marketer. And it's the understanding that they can't just keep talking to their audience. They can't just keep blogging and then... Um, posting that on social media, reaching the 1,000 people that follow the blog and the 10,000 people that follow them on Facebook, because they'd only be talking to a very small fraction of the potential customers. And that really, a lot of the job is hacking into desirable audiences, audiences that contain their potential customers to a lesser or greater extent, and getting the content that they create in front of those audiences. Equally, there are irrelevant audiences that as link builders, we might have been trying to pursue, trying to put links on these websites just because they're very authoritative. A uh, content marketer can really should probably be ignoring these irrelevant audiences because they have no overlap with the potential customers and focus on talking to desirable audiences. So that's the framework for thinking about this. Goals on the left, that's the first question, and promotion plan on the right. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of tactics now, and I'm going to use exactly this model for thinking about it um, to explain the tactics. The first tactic um, is events link building. And I'm going to start, um, if you imagine on the left over here, um, there is you know, old school link building, or our gold standard of link building. And on the far right, uh, we have the full flowering of content marketing, what it can be. We're going to move through these examples, um, these tactics, from the left to the right, from link building to content marketing. So this is a very much a link building tactic. Um, the goals are relevant traffic and qualified traffic, uh, relevant links and qualified traffic, and the promotion plan is content. Uh, we're going to have to um, have an event, and we're going to have to have a landing page for that event, and then search in that we're going to build links. We have a client called New View Oklahoma. Um, they're a local charity, and they don't do many events, but what they do do is a tour uh, every month of their facility. So uh, we maintain a list of um, all the different events directories uh, in our prime market. And uh, I've found that most large size markets will have around 20 uh, event link building directories that you can, you can build links on. 
and uh, we've gotten it down to a bit of an art. We can build these links at 18 minutes per link. Uh, that's the average at which we're billing them. And um, they fall into three main categories. National event directories, things like Eventful, Yelp, and Eventbrite that you see here. These are nofollow links, although they have high authority domains. And since they're nofollow, uh, my belief is that no authority passes. They do not impact rankings at all. Local media event directories, um, they have a high authority and they're very relevant, they're very local, but the listings tend to disappear after the events pass and sometimes they're no follow. And then local event directories, these are often maintained by individuals um, who are passionate about you know, their local community. Um, often these uh, listings will disappear uh, after the event passes. So there are some problems with this kind of link building. But the links disappearing isn't necessarily a problem uh, if you believe in uh, link ghosts or link echoes. And uh, Moz have some pretty good data uh, that suggests that these exist and that um, links followed links after they are taken away, um, the, the benefit to rankings remains. So here's the results of this events link building. Uh, and over two months, James Young, uh, took five hours and created 11 followed linking root domains and six no followed linking root domains. But look at the traffic stats, um, 14 page views and 15 seconds time on page. Um, really measly, um, hardly anybody actually wanted to see this event and of those people who did come through, they spent very little time on the website. I would say that um, that's a really good sign that we only did this for the link building uh, merits. By contrast, we also hold a conference here in Oklahoma City every year called Confluence, um, and we're in our we're going to be in our third year this year. But over the last two years, we've probably invested 320 hours in putting that conference on uh, for Big Wing Interactive. And look at the results that we've gained by focusing on the quality of the content and the quality of the conference, rather than on just building links to something which actually isn't of very much merit. Uh, a ton of page views, engaged users, a massive social reach, um, uh, 87 followed linking root domains, um, as well as a bunch of permission assets and a number of 300 ticket sales. We've made two hires um, from this event and onboarded three clients. So lots of, of, of additional benefits. And in fact, I uh, did a PubCon talk last year, and you can follow that bit.ly link uh, to see basically an hour of me talking about the tactics that we uh, leveraged in order to, uh, the inbound marketing tactics that we leveraged in order to promote that conference. Reporter outreach is another, uh, another staple of many campaigns and uh, the way that it's often uh, executed, um, it's more like a, a PR tactic or, or a little bit like a traditional link building tactic. We use Harrow, which is free, help a reporter out. Uh, reporters looking for sources for their stories and ProfNet costs us about $3,000 a year. We also have that. But we do a few things that really help us uh, in our success with this. And the example I'm gonna give you here is a vet. Um, so we can do this even with local vets. And what we do is we create a, a landing page on their website that positions them as an authority with a photo of them, their experience, expertise, and lists their publications. And then we preempt Harrow requests by creating quotable blog posts on the topics that we think are gonna come up. And then we create the ideal email outreach, and, and this is a great example of that, where we basically say, hi, um, you know, this is a great topic. In fact, we, we've we just blogged about it ourselves. You can go see it here. Uh, and here's a page all about um, our expert and all the reasons why, you know, you should consider using them. And in fact, they've also been quoted in the Associated Press recently. And what we found with this is over the course of a year for a local vet, we answered 41 requests and were successful 49% of the time with an average domain authority of 49. So 49% um, of the time we would get featured by the journalist. And then we do a second round of outreach saying, hey, um, remember that page all about our, you know, all about, you know, this expert. Um, would you mind linking that when you mention them? Would you mind linking it to that page? And it will validate them for your audience. And we find pretty good uh, success there. So that 17% of the total uh, number of requests end up with a link from a, a you know, usually pretty good authority source. In this instance, for the, for the vet, it's Pet360 and Petcentric are a couple of the 
examples of uh, the websites we got. So again, over the course of a year, 21 hours we spent securing seven followed linking root domains, um, 20 page views, and just nine seconds time on page. So the people uh, you know, reading these websites still find these links more or less irrelevant. <coughs> Monitoring mentions, um, this is a good example of, of this. Um, this is something that uh, you should probably be doing if you have uh, a reasonable size brand. One of our clients is a um, regional healthcare uh, system, and um, we're not finding much, uh, we're not finding that TalkWalk or Google or um, Google Alerts is working very well for us as far as monitoring mentions. Uh, so we do a search like this in Google the brand minus the website that the brand is on uh, over the last month. And what we found when we did this w was that we were seeing a lot of articles um, that featured two things that they did, the Wayman Tisdale Freshman of the Year Award and the Thunder Development Center, both of which they had naming rights to. So we built landing pages for these things, in-depth landing pages, honestly, definitive content. Um, the Wayman Tisdale Award has a list of everybody who's ever won it, for instance. Um, the Thunder Development Center has a video all about that, 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 that center. And this back ends into another tactic, which is link bait. We're creating pieces of content that we know people will want to link to. And with this tactic, uh, over the course of about six months, we requested 22 links from the average domain authority of 50 uh, websites, and we had the link granted 45% of the time from uh, really some incredible websites, including mba.com and cbssports.com. So here's this, uh, this tactic, and you can see 10 followed linking root domains over 41 hours, which includes the building of those pages and the content. And those pages obviously have their own inherent value. Um, and that generated 446 page views, and the time on page is now up to 1 minute and 25 seconds, which is much more healthy. People are actually coming to these pages and are engaged in these pages. Ego bait is a similar tactic, um, a little more advanced perhaps, um, but you can see it, it has the ability to drive more goals, and um, in this instance, the promotion plan draws on three of our disciplines, content, social, and outreach. This is a classic piece of link bait for a custom tailor. Um, 25 men, every man of style should follow online. Uh, we promote that uh, through Twitter and various different social channels. Um, and then we reached out to the 25 influencers uh, that were featured, and 10 of them shared the URL, and one of them linked to the piece of content from their blog. It's a great link. And uh, the point here is that uh, a good rule of thumb might be 50% of your time spent creating the content and 50% of your time spent actually doing the outreach and the marketing on the back end that will drive people and potentially links to your content. And this is the uh, w one of the people who uh, followed the, uh, who shared the, uh, the link. And uh, these are all influencers, so all 10 of them sharing is great. Um, this guy, a contr contributing writer with the style blog at Esquire, um, went on to share further pieces of content and has become a bit of a, an advocate for the brand. So here's Dan Holmes, um, the content marketer who executed this piece of, of content marketing. Um, and in seven hours, a little bit over seven hours, he created one follow linking root domain, but 94 shares and 81 um, social um, permission assets, which is great. And there's really great engagement on the, on the, on the, uh, for the people who read the piece as well. Newsjacking is a little bit more uh, in-depth, uh, a little bit more sophisticated, and requires more of a relationship with a brand that is perhaps a little more present uh, in the media. Etc. Um, and here's uh, an example of that. Well, we look after a, a university, and uh, this is uh, one of their alum who went on American Idol. Uh, she went on with a puppet that was um, a ventriloquist act that she did, and she got voted through, but the puppet got voted off. And so uh, within a week, we turned this around as a piece of um, newsjacking. <coughs> we created a video for the puppet. Uh, and it was his debut rap single, and it was a local rapper that we kind of uh, brought in um, to to dub over, um, you know, just a rap, a, a really kind of um, uh, gutsy rap video where the the puppet called out all the judges, and um, you know, basically uh, s s 
got his career started. Got nearly 10,000 um, views so far. And um, we then outreach to all the places that traditionally cover um, American Idol. And we managed to score some great links from places like The Hollywood Reporter and Yahoo TV uh, with an average domain authority of 73. So in, those, in the 80 hours that it took, and it really did take some investment to create that piece of content, it's, it's a great video, you should go check it out. Um, we managed to generate six followed linking root domains, four no followed linking root domains, but a ton of social activity and uh, a bunch of uh, engagement on the page. The pertinent point here is the level of um, knowledge that we needed about our customers, the level of trust that was required um, of them in order for us to create that piece of content. But also then as the content marketing manager, I needed to uh, understand um, this content marketer, Adam Ray, in the, his, his own personal skill set. His original idea was a, a narrative short, and I suggested that it should, be, it should draw on his skills as um, a, rap, a producer of rap albums and a musician, um, and that we should do that instead. This is the final piece of uh, example tactic that I want to give you because I think it shows the full flowering of, of, of content marketing. We're doing a lot of this definitive content and I'm calling for a lot of the content that we create to be definitive. Um, potentially you can, fit, you can hit all the goals and the promotion plan can draw on all of the different disciplines. In this instance, it does. One of the things that um, I would encourage any content marketer to do is um, if they're worried about the promotion plan of their content, to think about whether they are hitting each of the disciplines. So they may have a great piece of content, um, but no real marketing plan in place. Well, uh, have you thought about social? Okay, let's firm that up. Have you thought about search? Ah, okay, let's firm that up. What about outreach? Ah, okay, let's firm that up. If you're doing all four of those things, then you're probably gonna have a pretty robust piece of content marketing. This is a local, uh, well, not a local, this is a Colorado Springs um, a landscaper, and uh, they also install Christmas lights in the off season. <coughs> and so we thought we'd come up with a definitive piece of content, the definitive Colorado Springs Christmas lights guide. The two questions that uh, I have content marketers write when they uh, answer when they come up with pieces of content that are definitive is has it been done already and can we do it better? And these are good questions for any piece of content really. In this instance the answer was it had been done before but we felt that we could do it better. So we set out to do it better and this is that piece of content. <clears throat> On the uh, Google map we, uh, we put stars in, uh, in, go in uh, green for uh, lights that our own client had actually put up. So the, the marketing is working all the way around here. We involved the Reddit community, we asked them for their opinions, and then we posted it afterwards. We found that went down really well. And we outreached to 30 homeowners associations, 20 of whom contributed to the guide, or shared it. And that just took an hour and a half with mail merge and drove, we think, a thousand, more than a thousand visits through direct traffic. We socially shared it and, it, and it did really well. 1,500 likes and shares. We put $50 behind it, and you can see the orange part of that boost uh, down here um, is the, 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 the social sharing, um, the, the paid social sharing. Uh, so it was doing well on its own. Lights installation page views went up 242%. And the ranking improved as well. Competing content even linked to us. And next, we can pursue the competing content's backlinks. So the original piece of definitive content that we now think we're better than, these are its links, including places like True Colorado Culture and My 719 Mums, which will be great links for our landscaper in Colorado Springs. We can outreach to them and say, hey, you linked to this piece of content, you might want to link to us too. So here's Rachel Cunningham, and in 14 hours she managed to achieve um, 8,000 page views with a three minute time on page, 1,500 social shares, um, three followed linking root domains, four no followed linking root domains, 25 permission assets, and five conversions. And just the conversions more than paid for the, the cost of that content. The old argument to um, why link building was so hard was that nobody wanted to link to the website. Well, the answer to that these days is to build linkable assets. And I've talked you through some of those linkable assets. Um, one I haven't mentioned off to the left here is other websites that aren't your own website that refer converting traffic. You can actually build links to uh, websites that aren't even on your domain 
in order to get them ranking high so that they send more converting traffic. You can also go out to create pieces of content on other websites um, that you think will be able to rank for keywords that you want to go after um, with the aim of driving that traffic to your website to convert. So why are we still talking about link building um, if this is really the space of content marketing? Well, um, this is some data from our clients, uh, clients who have SEO, content marketing, and PPC. And um, the average last touch conversion source is 39% of the times organic search. So ultimately, when it's time to make a purchase, people type in those buying keywords, and they, they click through to whatever ranks, and they tend to make that purchase. So ranking is really important. Now, I started with uh, talking about how hard link building has become, uh, what, a, what a difficult job it was, and really um, what, a, what, a, what a problem that we had with morale in our team of link builders. It was the lowest morale team in, in our whole department. And I believe it's now become perhaps the highest morale team in our department. And I caught this tweet from a content marketer recently. Have I mentioned recently how much I love my job? The good news is that we've found that content marketing is a more um, enjoyable, more creative. Um, honestly, it's a closer fit to real marketing um, than link building ever was. Um, so I encourage anybody uh, who is still doing old school link building to make that transition to content marketing because um, I think it'll be well worth your while. Thank you very much. And finally, a, a shout out to uh, Brent Pittman, who is pictured on the right of uh, far right of this slide, uh, he's the uh, was the, one of the original link builders who managed to make the transition to content marketing, and um, during that transition became the content marketing manager, um, and who obviously uh, a lot of what we've managed to achieve here is is down to his hard work, as well as the team's hard work in general. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and you can uh, check out some of my other uh, presentations on um, my YouTube channel. Thank you.